A common thread in our discussions on the Interaction Hour and within the School of Interactive Computing as a whole has been the human experience of computing. How do we pursue research and innovation that benefits all humans with an eye toward equity, diversity, social impact, and more? One of the biggest challenges to achieving this is how do we engage with traditionally underrepresented populations in the field? Today's guest has offered one novel solution that has achieved success here at Georgia Tech. Associate Professor Betsy DeSalvo is the principal investigator on the DataWorks project, a program that has brought employment and engagement to non-data scientists. In this episode, we'll discuss the accomplishments of DataWorks, explore how it engages those without a background in computer science, and how it improves our pursuit of equity in computing. I'm Ayanna Howard, Chair of Georgia Tech School of Interactive Computing, and this is the Interaction Hour. <music> professor Betsy DeSalvo is an Associate Professor in IC and the Director of the Culture and Technology Lab. Her research focuses on the study of informal learning techniques and the impact of cultural values on technology use and production. One of her past initiatives includes a project named Glitch Game Testers that leveraged young African-American males' passion for gaming into an interest in CS. Betsy, I am excited about this topic and thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So you have this program called DataWorks and you along with your colleagues just received a 1.5 million grant to extend your research in this area. Can you explain what this program is and what led you to envision this new project? Sure, um, so DataWorks is in many ways like a small company that we're running outside of, uh, out of Georgia Tech. And it really has two goals. One is an outreach arm for the College of Computing where we hire and train young people 18 to 25 years of age um, mostly from minoritized communities as data wranglers. And that's entry level work into the data field, prepping data for data scientists and analysts. So the goal isn't necessarily to lead people into doing this work so they become computer science undergraduates, although that's a great outcome. Um, we think that there's great economic opportunities simply in this kind of work. It's a growing field, data's everywhere. Currently, a lot of this work is being done by data scientists or hired out to gig workers or overseas workers. We actually think this is a much more equitable way to pay people for doing this kind of work and helps train people for the data workforce. Another goal of DataWorks is really to offer us a research platform. Um, a lot of this, I'm a learning scientist, offers us an opportunity to do research to understand how situated learning takes place in the workplace. We can watch it up close. Um, and particularly looking at how data literacy and critical data literacy happens in the workplace. It's a very authentic environment for us to study. Um, we also hope to better understand human elements of data and the impact of people from different backgrounds contributing to data might end up shaping the data that we have and how it affects choices that are made. These could be civic choices that are made or they could be choices that are made inside companies. So we're asking questions like how do these young people coming from marginalized communities contribute to our understanding of data in new ways, right? They may have experiences, for example, with Atlanta housing that's unique to them. So when they're looking at housing data, they may be able to interpret that data differently. Finally, we also see research on the development of public research institutions like Georgia Tech, developing sustainable businesses to help with educational outreach. And really, what are the elements that need to be considered when we're structuring these public business collaborations? So DataWorks, there, there's a lot of objectives here. And so I'm gonna kind of peel back a little bit um, and, and kind of address the things that piqued my interest a little. So one was this word you used, uh, which was data wrangling. And all of a sudden what I saw was like some type of cowboy out in the field and all these numbers and I'm lassoing and, I, and I'm sure that's not what you mean by data wrangling. So what is that? Define that for us. Sure, um, there's a few different terms that are used for this. Some people just call it data cleaning and some people call it uh, data janitors. 
Um, I like data wrangling because it's a little more all-encompassing. Um, the idea of raw data really is an oxymoron. All the data that we're using in data science as an analyst um, has been collected, cleaned, structured, and culled. And that work is often actually quite tedious work very time consuming, yet it requires some technical training to complete, right? So what we're doing is providing the data workers for the, the technical training that they need. And while it might be technically challenging at first, they're repeating the same task over and over again. It's kind of a neat thing because it provides, first of all, motivation to learn that technical skill, but then also the repetition helps them learn it better, right? And all within this authentic learning environment. Um, so we expect most people over the course of their time being a data wrangler, they're going to learn a wide range of technical skills from that process. So you mentioned this technical training and, and so a new uh, kind of I'm going to be trained as a data wrangler. You, but you also mentioned the kind of the target demographic. Um, you had talked about 18 to 24 year olds, uh, primary focus on marginalized communities. Um, and so I, if I think about this population, a couple of challenges come to mind. So one is, uh, you know, why should an 18 year old care? Um, you know, 18 year olds, they're, they're typically, you know, right out of high school, teenagers. I mean, data wrangling, like really? Uh, so that's the one question. And then the other is, is like, okay, so maybe they do care, but how do you engage them? Like, how do you maybe amp up why, why they should care or, or why this is really important for them and their communities? Well, I think one would think that young people aren't interested in this work, um, but once they become exposed to it, they actually do start getting really engaged with the data. One of the advantages that we have is that we see a lack of opportunities for young people in this demographic, particularly. Um, black adolescent Americans have the summit highest unemployment rates in the country. So we're giving them a unique opportunity because it's a higher paying job um, than they otherwise could probably get in the Atlanta area. We're paying $15 an hour, which we think of as a living wage in Atlanta. Um, and they also really love a chance to do work that feels more respected. Um, Pre-COVID, we were all coming into Georgia Tech and they felt like they were a part of the Georgia Tech community. Um, it was amazing for them. This is a silly antidote, but they were invited in to use the, the coffee maker and the kitchen on the same floor as the Dean as a College of Computing. And they felt really privileged by that, right? That they were part of that community. Um, so they feel very respected in the work that they're doing. Um, we're also making a lot of connections with nonprofits and they're sort of helping us with our recruitment. Um, so they've been helping us recruit young people that will be able to take advantage of this opportunity. Young people who have maybe not had a lot of advantages previously, but are ripe for the opportunity that we're giving them. Um, some of the data workers have been doing projects on the side. We've given them some workshops and opportunities to do projects on their own interest. And so um, one of the young men we were working with did a project on police violence against young black men. Another one of the student, one of the people that we're working with did a project on gentrification in the west side that they saw happening in their own neighborhood. Um, so they went out and found their own data sources to try and understand these things and it really helped in a couple ways. One, it served this purpose of getting them engaged with data on another level besides just wrangling it. But it also helped us see where there are kind of critical data literacy issues that they weren't um, gaining from doing the data wrangling. And so that helped us um, create some more learning opportunities for them. So you mentioned two um, projects, uh, kind of more self-interest, and one was police violence and the other was, was gentrification. And, you know, this that really deals with collection of civic data, it sounds like to me. Um, and so if I think about the customers, the organizations that would be interested in, in your data data wrangling kind of projects. Um, I would say maybe government, maybe local agencies. Have they have they shown interest in this kind of work? Yeah, most of the projects we have been working on have been civic organizations um, in different capacities. One of the projects we're currently working on is with the Center for Civic Innovation. We've been taking their PDFs from all of the neighborhood meetings, the MPU meetings in Atlanta over the past 20 years. Um, and taking all that data, which is in PDF format, uh, 
uh, creating spreadsheets from that data that's um, basically helped us document what has gone up for a vote at each one of these MPUs in the past 20 years and now we're going to be comparing that to what the city actually did. So seeing if these neighborhood groups are actually having an impact on civic change. Okay, so it is a lot of, of, of civic data and civic groups. So, so let me get back to um, one of my initial comments was that uh, if I think about data works and its place, it really does lead to uh, a potential way forward if I think about equity and computing. And so I just want to hear from you, how does this work directly contribute to equity and computing? Sure. I mean, I think that obviously there's some contribution with employment in terms of computing, but I also think that we know bias is built into data and that ends up impacting the systems that we build and the decisions that we make based off of data. Um, part of that bias is built into the way that data is collected and cleaned and, and then how it's called and used. Um, one of the ways that we can start to address some of these issues is building a greater diversity in the people who do that data wrangling and the analysis, which we hope these young people go into eventually. Um, but even in the wrangling stages of this, the context that they're bringing to data hopefully will bring a broader understanding, particularly around some of these civic data issues. So you mentioned um, bias in data, you mentioned diversity of the individuals working with this data. Um, and, and I would say that a bias in data, this, this is a, a problem in society in general, and it's causing a lot of people to have a, a, a relationship of distrust with, with data and with systems that use data. So if you think about this, how do you approach um, the, the individuals that you're trying to recruit, the individuals that you I want to work with um, about this aspect of, you know, the data and the distrust and, and their roles. Like, what is your message for that? Yeah, I think you and I probably have enough background in computing that we can be a little paranoid about data. Um, we know all the problems. We see it on a regular basis. And I think this is actually an important message. It's not that the rest of society knows this. Computer scientists know it, right? Um, other people know it too, but certainly these young people we're working with, they are not coming into the program concerned about data privacy. Um, as they are working in the program, they're becoming more aware and actually passing some of that awareness on to their friends and families. They're telling us stories about how they tell people who's gathering data on them. And so we can sort of to see some of the seeds we're planting spreading amongst the community. Um, now, I mean, I think, to be honest, most of them actually have some bigger challenges in their life right now than worrying about their personal data being spread around. But they're beginning to really recognize that some of the ways data is collected and what is collected can be the root of some of those challenges itself. Um, for example, the data worker who's looking at gentrification in her neighborhood, um, she began to explore redlining in real estate and lending practices as a historic example of data collection that led to oppression in her neighborhood. Um, and then she also started to see that if she could follow trends in data, um, that her or maybe members of her community could start doing what some of the white people who have come into her community have been doing, which is buying houses cheap in their neighborhood, fixing them up, and then selling them for a profit. So she's seeing data both as how it's been sort of a tool for oppression, but also saying, if I start to learn more about this, maybe I can be part of the solution for my own community. Which basically means understanding data gives you, it gives you power. It empowers you to not only make decisions, but also understand what decisions have been used against you in the past, which is, which is great. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you about, uh, you gave this example of uh, a young lady looking at redlining. Um, and if, if, as I recall correctly, this isn't your first foray into working with, with this, this demographic. Um, earlier, you had a program called Glitch, where you, were work, you worked with uh, 16 to 18 year olds and young black men in public school systems in Atlanta. Um, here, you focus, you, you've expanded that and focus on uh, larger groups in terms of marginalized communities. So where does this, this this feeling of responsibility come from? I mean, given that you know you started working with young black men, you're definitely not. A, 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 you don't identify as. as I'm none male, of those as things. Far as I yes. know. <laughs> <laughs> and so, where does this? Where did this come from in terms of the responsibility? 
Yeah, when I started working with Glitch, it didn't come from that sense of responsibility. Really, I had started doing research way back at the University of Pittsburgh um, with a program that was developing games for middle school girls to get them interested in science and technology. Um, about half the young women I was working with were black. So I started to look for research on how you know, young black women were using games. And what I found was there's lots of research on women and girls in gaming at that time. Um, and this is around 2005, 2006, but there really wasn't any research on blacks in gaming. And even today, you won't find very much. So what research I did find sort of highlighted how young black men were often gaming at higher rates than other demographics, but weren't leveraging that into an interest in computing. And so that sort of belayed my entire thesis with this project, which was if I get girls into gaming, they'll go into computing just like the boys do. But if it wasn't holding true for young black men, that actually wasn't what was going on. So that intellectual spark is what got me working with young black men and then as I did, and I developed the Glitch Game Testing Program, which you know ran for three years, where I was working full time with these young men over the summer, there was like 33 of them, um, I became part of their community. And I really felt like I was a part of their family in many ways. And it really changed my perspective on the work. It was about intellectual questions, sure. I'm still interested in those things, but also it became a reality for me that like I had to give back to this community that was giving so much to me. And that's really where the passion for this work has come from and continues. Um, which, is, which is great. I, I always believe that you know, diversity is not a problem of diverse people. It's, it's the problem for all people since we are actually all diverse in some yeah. form or fashion. Um, so I'm, I'm listening uh, to this episode. I'm like, oh, this sounds fascinating and amazing this data works and you know, like maybe even reading more about glitch maybe i want to do something in my community um maybe i want to be a, a data wrangler myself but i don't know if i'm qualified so um who are you looking for and what are you asking for them give me your pitch yeah so we're looking for young people from lower income neighborhoods who have a high school degree or equivalent um, and some basic skills, skills with word processing and Excel, right? We're not looking for people who are computer scientists to work as data workers. Um, we want them to have an interest in building up their skills with computing, um, but we don't need them to have any other real background. Um, we're also looking for clients to work with us on data cleaning projects. So um, we charge very competitive rates um, and we often do that first project pro bono to make sure if it's a fit for the clients and for us. Um, we're also looking for students and researchers who are interested in working on projects and to help us with managing the data workers. We have an open position right now um, for a research scientist on the project. So there's a lot of opportunities for building up the program and we are excited to talk to anybody who has an interest. Um, so basically, uh, if you are listening in, uh, this call is for you because it seems like there is a position for anyone to be involved in this, which is which is awesome. So this is DataWorks, uh, focusing on really um, building up uh, capacity, building up a, a new generation of, of workers, data wranglers, um, and the the impact, which I think is great, is making uh, the data that's used, that's fed into some of these you know, AI, machine learning systems, making it so that it's, it's a little less biased uh, because you do have different voices um, impacting it from the beginning as well as toward, toward the end. Um, I appreciate you joining the podcast today. Um, and again, if you like what you heard and are interested in learning more or suggesting your own topics for the podcast, be sure to connect with us on Twitter or Facebook at IC at GT. Thanks for listening.